Good afternoon, and welcome to Voices from the Field, the topic of today's human rights conversation. As part of McGill's Center for Human Rights and Legal Pluralism's ongoing series on human rights dialogue. I am the moderator for today's dialogue. My name is Derek Jones. I uh, lecture at the Faculty of Law here and am a member for the Center for Human Rights and Legal Pluralism. My research with the center focuses on disability, health, human rights, and bioethics. Today's dialogue, Voices from the Field of Human Rights, is graced by two colleagues uh, who are also members of the Center for Human Rights and Legal Pluralism, human rights lawyer and author Pearl Elidius, and current UN Special Rapporteur on the Sudan, Aristide Nanossi. As we begin our stroll with Pearl and Aristide, uh, let us pause for a moment to note important dimensions of voices, um, not from the trenches, but voices from the field or fields of human rights. Who are these voices and what are the evolving fields of human rights? If we heed the title of the Center for Human Rights and Legal Pluralism, then we know the voices will be diverse and pluralistic. Some of the who are these voices is captured in a group profile of the, of the panel. We've talked about this before, but beyond being lawyers, all of us here have significant teaching experience at the faculty. Each of us have years of public service in government, ministries, public policy, and law that touch on fundamental rights and human freedoms. All of us have worked on important national and international files, questions, or missions that evoke human rights issues. So before we get to know the particulars of our colleagues, particular path, let me seed some intrigue by a rhetorical quiz. Who amongst we three has worked with, collaborated on, or even petitioned for change the following organizations? the Canadian Human Rights Museum and Commission, government or NGOs in Rwanda, Ethiopia, East Timor, the UN High Commission on Human Rights, the African Development Bank, UNESCO, the International Labor Organization, the Law Reform Commission of Canada, or the World Bank. Our dialogue will resolve the intrigue and may show why and how the work of our colleagues and these institutions, which some of, some of which do not have human rights names in their titles, work in ways that nonetheless affect national and global human rights. Finally, in terms of our introduction of the evolving fields of human rights, I invite attention to two relevant historic markers for our dialogue. The first, is that next year marks the seventh decade since the world adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In the 1940s, the faculty's own professor of law, John Humphreys, helped author that international document as international public servant with the UN. May I suggest that many of us in this room and on this panel and at the center continue to work on bringing its principles to daily life. Second, in that regard, Ten years after the 1948 Universal Declaration, one of its key leaders and champions, Eleanor Roosevelt, said the following about implementing the principles of the Universal Declaration. And this is an off-quoted excerpt. She asked, where, after all, do universal human rights begin? In small places close to home, so close that, and so small that they cannot be seen on maps of the world. Yet they are the world of the individual person, the neighborhood, the college, the factory, the office, the farm, the places where every man, woman, and child seeks equal justice, equal opportunity, and equal dignity. Unless these rights have meaning there, they have little meaning anywhere. Without concerned citizen action to uphold them close to home, then we shall look in vain for progress in the larger world. So Roosevelt's vision of the layers and diversity of the fields of human rights, I think, have been visited by our colleagues. So let's turn to them, what they've done in the field, carrying forward that vision with their expertise, their labor, and maybe even creativity 
um, in the ongoing frontiers and fields of human rights. So I'd like to begin by asking a couple formative and personal questions, up close and personal as they say. So to help portray the evolving and diverse human rights family, uh, maybe if you begin with uh, Pearl, um, tell us a bit about your personal formative background. Uh, we, we three were born on different continents, so your schooling, your early professional experience, how you balance professional and field work, and if you get to it, a fun answer might be, uh, at what age did you sense that human rights became important to you? Pearl? And we only have an hour. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, thanks very much for that kind introduction. Thanks very much to the Center for making this opportunity available. Um, so my background actually was in biology. I started off uh, across the way here. I'm not sure which way I'm pointing. I think it's, it's this way. Uh, at the, <coughs> excuse me, the Stewart Biology Building. I was working with uh, chimpanzees on feeding behavior of primates in captivity. And uh, at that time, uh, Jane Goodall had done chimps, so I was interested in actually in gorillas and thought that Central Africa was a great place to be. But this was around the time that Diane Fossey was getting murdered um, uh, in Central Africa and uh, in the Virunga, and so, and so there was a thought that this might not be a great idea from a career perspective, so, so I kind of, went down the evolutionary scale and moved into law. So I, was, uh, I, was, I did the common law and the civil law degrees here at McGill, spent a little bit of time uh, at Oxford where I did my graduate work. I came back and did the bar here and I got interested in human rights because you mentioned John Humphrey in your introduction. He um, uh, was the founder of something called the Canadian Human Rights Foundation, now better known to people of course as uh, Equitas which has become an international uh, reference point, I think, for, for human rights education uh, globally. Um, and uh, they used to have their international summer course in Prince Edward Island, which is where uh, John had his summer house. And so we would all go to Prince Edward Island and uh, learn about human rights. And it was a very didactic style, and it was a very, uh, you know, we didn't have human rights courses of any significance really in, in the faculty at the time. There was an international course taught by Professor Humphrey, but uh, there was very little else at the time. So, so this was really uh, uh, an opportunity for us to develop our, our understanding of and depth in, in human rights. And uh, I really enjoyed the course. I thought that uh, it, it made me think that law, uh, and I'm, I'm cribbing this term, but is about human flourishing and is not a, a, only or uh, uh, strictly a technical exercise, that it's about ensuring that law is used as a, as a constructive tool to facilitate human flourishing. And um, of course that, that term is um, stolen from uh, Marty Koskineski, but the, Koskiniemi, but the point is that if you see law in that kind of um, instrumental way, then, then a lot changes, and, 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 that, and I think it changes whether you practice law traditionally, which I've done, uh, or practice it uh, in a court of, in a more advisory or consultancy way, which I, I do now. Um, so that was, my, that was my way into law, and I was inspired by people like uh, Julius Gray and Erwin Kotler and many other people who, way before it was popular to do so, were combining uh, teaching and, and intellectual work with with practice, uh, and and of course that creates tensions within within the academy. But it it is an interesting way of thinking about how you do law and how you connect uh, the reality, if you will, uh, to to the classroom. Great. Um, I have a, a follow up question, but let maybe go to to Aristide in, in your formative uh, path. Yes. Thank you. Thanks again for the center to give us this opportunity to have to be part of this dialogue. Um, my curriculum is a bit different from my colleague and uh, I started law in my country in Benin. And as part of the curricula, we have what we call uh, draw, the law and draw humanitaire as part of the course. That is mandatory for all students uh, they, to get the first law degree. So that's the way I start law and be affected by human rights and humanitarian law at that time. And then after my, my PhD, and then I, I start working with the ILO, the International Labour Organization in Geneva. And then as a maritime labour law, especially because my background is maritime labour law, actually, and labour law in general. And then I was in charge of 
legislative and labor law reform in Africa in general. And then in early 90s, the labor fundamental principle of law was been seen under the angle of human rights. So then come the idea of human rights principle, human rights principle at workplaces. So that's why I came up to talk about human rights at the law place in terms of forced labor, for, uh, child labor, equality at the workplace, and all those things. So I was following all those aspects in the, in the early 19. And then I joined the African Development Bank as uh, head of appeal unit. The appeal unit is the unit that manages the staff dispute, staff conflict. And I remember one of the discussion I have with my supervisor, the vice president actually, telling him that all the staff have the right to contest a, def a decision that they think that is unfair to them. Say, no, 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 we are not here at the tribunal. Say, but it's part of the Universal Convention. So we have to establish a, a certain committee to hear the case of all the staff, even consultant. Because at that time, according to the rule, the staff rule of the organization, only staff member, what we call regular staff member, are empowered to litigate the case, to have the case heard. That's you know. Even the consultant, the short term staff, should have the power to go to the tribunal, to go to, to, to bring the case before the, the mechanism. They said, no, no, no. For, it took a long discussion to convince them, to persuade them. And we finally end up to establish a parallel mechanism to hear all the cases from the, the staff, including short term staff, general staff, consultant. That's how I came up with the human rights. And after that, I worked for international NGOs to litigate cases before International Human Rights Commission, the International Court, and uh, those are the ones, even Regional Commission as well, to hear the, to get those cases, to be heard by those commissions. And I have to say that, uh, to some extent, you have some frustration, but also we, as well, we do have also some achievement, and we need to be uh, proud of those achievements. So I want to hear a bit more about your, uh, the frustrations, maybe call them the challenges. Um, but also uh, some of the achievements. Um, but let me just, before we get too deeply into that, let me just ask a sort of follow-up on the personal path. And um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go back to you, Aristide, because you're, you're, uh, the, the conversation is warm there. Um, uh, you worked in international bureaucracies, if you wanna call that, but organizations where you um, became sensitive and had responsibilities for internal human rights. Eleanor Roosevelt's in the workplace. Mm -hmm. Is there a particular human right, because you mentioned a couple, that became sort of the lodestar um, or um, something that really moved you daily in your work uh, in, in, that, in, that, uh, in that process? Um, yes, like I just said, when I raised the issue of the, the right of staff or staff to contest any decision that affect the, the right and their working condition. When I raised this issue with the, my supervisor, they were very afraid. They said, no, 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 we are not in the, at the tribunal. No, what, what are you meaning by that? We have the human rights department who's released all those things. I said, no, no, no. But we should establish a mechanism that will empower them to raise any decision that they can't challenge before the, uh, the human rights system, the system. Because as you know, the uh, international organization have this privilege and immunity, the legal, uh, judicial immunity. All right. So. To some extent, some of them are not able to go to look at the domestic tribunal, for example. And because the domestic tribunal will say, no, 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 those are international organizations, we can't get involved to that. So if within the organization we don't have a system that will be able to listen to the case, so what are we doing to that? So those are things that we, maybe we can go develop a bit further later on so, while discussing. But. So it reminds me of the, the right to work uh, and fair adjudic adjudication of benefits and and burdens uh, and justice in the workplace. Um, and Pearl, uh, back to you about uh, the same question. Uh, is there a, because um, your path was obviously a little different than Aristide's um, from biology to uh, uh, human rights, um, but in your early career, did you have a catalyst moment, a cathartic moment when you, you that seized you and said, I must, I'm going to commit to this, uh, even if when we begin our career, sometimes we're a little trepid, we're a little convinced. Was there a, one of those lodestar moments out there that you can uh, reflect on? 
I, th I think uh, starting to, I, I spent a, a few years working in a large national law firm here in, in Montreal, and that was much more of a traditional practice. But I became more and more convinced that um, the way that law can work to strengthen institutions and to strengthen civil society as well were really fundamental to the way I saw law playing itself out and um, thought or hoped that I could have a, a role doing that. So I, I went to the Ontario Human Rights Commission where I spent uh, six years. And uh, uh, during that time became aware that Canadian human rights institutions with the possible exception of uh, Quebec were not using international standards at all uh, in their work. And so we started in the Ontario level using international standards to inform the way human rights institutions worked and that got the attention of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and so we started working with them. And, in the UN. Uh, so the OHCRC actually started you know, liaising with us. We had a conference together uh, which was unusual because at the time it really was the kind of apex institution, the national institution that would connect with, uh, with the UN bodies. But because of the way the jurisdictional issues were, the Ontario Commission at the time was a much larger commission and, and, and did a lot more uh, investigative work. And, and I think the OHCRC, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, saw it as a way into national institutions and making sure that those standards could... Uh, could be implemented and, and, and starting to see that reciprocal relationship between a national institution working on the ground in a given country or region and the way in which the international standards interact with those institutions. And so uh, I thought it was extremely important to, um, and I'm interested in organizational development, I'm interested in what lawyers can bring to uh, thinking about legislative uh, development, even if you're from a different jurisdiction, this idea of, of legal pluralism is a wonderful starting point, actually, to uh, go into a different country, as different as Tajikistan and Timor and Rwanda, to uh, help them draft their legislation. Uh, those were important sort of moments for, for me. And then, and then I suppose starting out, I mentioned uh, the early years at uh, Canadian Human Rights Foundation, now Equitas. You know, in the very early years, it was very much the traditional Canadian civil libertarian uh, movement that was populated by very well regarded, very white, very mainstream uh, litigators who uh, were all men. And, and uh, the vision of civil liberties at that time was very much focused on a particular vision of the way rights played out and who had access to them. And if I could just tell a very small anecdote, while we were out at this famous course in Prince Edward Island, um, learning about real rights, as it, they were then called, uh, like freedom of expression and, and freedom of religion, uh, one, of the, one of the senior facilitators thought it would be a wonderful idea to show a film about women's rights mm -hmm. and equality, something that was not discussed originally in the curriculum, and decided to show a film that was by the Canadian, uh, the National Film Board of Canada called uh, Not a Love Story. Now this may predate oh, many yes. of us in this room, but it was a very famous documentary at the time about uh, uh, women in the, in, the, in the, what we now call the sex trade industry. And uh, the moment that the film was uh, started to be shown to the participants in the room, a senior person from the organization whose name shall be unmentioned for the purpose of this uh, video, uh, arrived and fired the facilitator, and indeed fired the executive director on the spot. Uh, and, and although that was a bit dramatic at the moment, it actually you know, was a, a wonderful um, moment for explaining and showing and demonstrating to everybody in that room how the vision for rights and what we call rights and how we as lawyers and law students need to think about rights differently needed to change. I was going to say amusing, but not quite. Um, so, Lynn, let's turn to some of your, your current, um, and I lose that in a broad sense, ongoing um, human rights focus in the field. Um, so, drawing on your expertise, scholarship, and experience on key human rights challenges, maybe you could talk about two major ones that you have been uh, working on or continually working on, studying and confronting. And as part of that, that's, that's to give an insight into your practice uh, recently. Um, and why should the public care? Um, because uh, the, one of the things about human rights on, uh, on your global stage is it's far from home. Um, and uh, that's a major challenge, I think. But uh, we'd be very interested in two key challenges of your current sort of portfolio. Okay. Oh, thank you. Um, 
Currently, I'm the UN independent expert of the situation in human rights in Sudan, meaning the, the Sudan, not the South Sudan, uh, North Sudan, you put it that way. Um, my role is uh, to assess the human rights situation, to verify, assess, make an investigation and a report to the Human Rights Council, not only the Human Rights Council, and sometimes to time also to the General Assembly in New York as well on the human rights situation. So I was tasked to engage with the government of Sudan, the various stakeholders, including the academia, the civil societies, donor communities, and all those. So to, to work with them and also to get information from them. So my work is, is based on the information they provided to me and also the information I received from those, uh, my counterpart. And, um, I made a report and uh, in the case of the Sudan, for example, as you know, the situation of human rights is uh, very unpredictable, I put, to put it that way. And uh, the government tend to cooperate with me and also have to engage with the social, uh, civil society actors I'm talking about achievement. The achievement of this war is some, for some time when we will succeed to get the release of some human rights activists for sentence to who has been kept in uh, custody. You will succeed to release them for sentence to death, for example, or for imprisonment, for example. Those are things that, f to some extent, you will be proud because at least you see that why people should care. Those people who are the uh, parents or relatives who have been detained arbitrarily for five years, ten years without any access to legal jurisdiction, legal access to legal representative, when they get those people released, then the, the, those people, for example, are very okay, care okay about the system. So I do remember when you came to the country, all of them want to meet you to discuss, you raise any concern they have about human rights, and then you try to manage to discuss with them and engage with them. And uh, my role also involves also what they call technical assistance because beside the, the recommendation that I made for the Human Rights uh, Council, I will have to make also recommendation for technical assistance. So I, I urge the international community to support the effort of the government itself and to support the, to implement so as the government could comply with the international human rights standards and also to support in terms of uh, capacity building the civil society so that they can also try to assess also the human rights with me. Those are what we have been doing in the field, actually. And, uh, and when you say technical assistance, technical assistance, uh, some of it as, as you described it, but do you make those recommendations to the UN Council, to uh, the Sudan government, to civil society, or all of those? Yes, I made the recommendation not only to the, the recommendation in my report, I made the recommendation before the Human Rights Council. And but the recommendation is addressed not only to the government, but also the civil society organization, also to the international community donors. And to that end, I had to also like to stress on this point, because for example, in the case of Sudan, for example, the government of uh, Canada is supporting it, a human rights project in Sudan, for example, based on the recommendation that I submitted to the Human Rights Council. Okay. So that's an accountability plus uh, just to, not just to the Human Rights Council, the UN Human Rights Council, but to your home nation now, Canada. Mm -hmm. Can, Canada's yep. facilitating that. Um, and um, maybe we can explore that a bit more, but yep. Pearl, um, you've been, you, your, your path has taken you from <laughs> biology to the Human Rights, uh, uh, Ontario Human Rights Commission, and now on projects Maybe you could describe a bit more of some of the projects you're doing in the field or have done recently with an eye towards um, some of the challenges that are recurrent, uh, maybe two, um, that uh, you run up against as a, an advocate and analyst and counselor to uh, governments and NGOs. Uh, well, in, in my practice, I spend a lot of time talking to individuals who are trying to access the human rights system in Canada. So, so and, the, and the first thing that's you know, very obvious to me is that we have a very inaccessible system in Canada. Although filing a human rights complaint in Canada is technically free, um, the reality is that for many people the system is confusing, they don't understand it, 
uh, or they have a different position on their case than the Human Rights Commission ends up having. And so the types of supports that are in place, I think for the average person, I, I had a call with somebody this morning who um, you know, wanted to uh, retain a lawyer to help her on a complex case before the Federal Court of Canada, and uh, the fees that she was able to afford were uh, less than half of, of what uh, a relatively small firm in practice would be able to charge. So I spent a lot of time talking to people who uh, essentially are unable to to access the system and and on the international side of what I do this issue of access to justice I think is really really fundamental and it's of course much more pressing in developing countries um, I've also had the opportunity of working in Sudan in fact we found out that we have a, a connection with Luckily. the uh, with the National <laughs> Human Rights Institution in, in uh, the Republic of Sudan um, you know the the average person has very little knowledge of and access to a lot of these institutions and that's a quite a deliberate uh, action by the government to make sure that people don't know about these institutions and don't access them, or that if they do, the institutions are essentially toothless or have relatively minimal impact. So you know, that's a problem, and I think the international community, uh, including the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and special mandate holders, have a big role in sensitizing uh, organizations to this. Uh, on the access to justice front, uh, access to justice for women is a huge problem in developing countries. Um, I was working with the UN Women for, I guess, almost a year and a half on a, a project involving uh, access to justice in the context of the new sustainable development goals that uh, have been implemented uh, by the international community, uh, particularly with regard to um, access to justice, civil society, peace, equalities, institution building. And, and uh, one of the interesting statistics that came out of this work was that 80% of women in developing countries go to informal justice mechanisms in order to have their result, their their disputes resolved, and 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 that was that was a huge eye opener. I mean, I certainly you know one thinks in rural areas, perhaps you understand it, or uh, in, in in remote areas, but 80% is a, is a big number, and it really signals the limited reach of what you know, it was often called the classical court system and, and its limitations in terms of being able to uh, offer people meaningful, meaningful resources and meaningful access to resources. So uh, that's an area that I've, I've spent time working in and, and thinking about and, and it really makes you uh, understand the critical importance of connecting formal law as we understand it in this faculty with uh, what happens on the ground for most people, which has no resemblance or very little resemblance to formal law. So um, uh, just a quick question that maybe crosses both of your fields. Is institution building, building these human rights commissions um, or, uh, or forum in other countries, is that part of your technical assistance as well? And so then my question is, because I've, re I've read some of your book, and um, you said that uh, this, you raised the big question of access to justice. And I think one in your book you point out for the Canadian system that um, there are um, many issues, both positive and negative, but one of the, the challenges is, is the time delay uh, of getting um, a complaint, uh, usually on some equality or whatever um, violation, uh, to be heard and addressed. Um, so um, I, was, I was struck by that. Um, you consider that an access to justice issue, and what do you see as um, that parallel to in, in, in other countries? Um, is it the existence of commissions like that? Um, and then maybe we can talk about some solutions or... or I mean, yes and yes. <laughs> the the uh, it, delays are a problem, but I actually think that delays are a symptom and not the actual issue. So uh, delays, in, in, in certainly in the Canadian context, are a function of the fact that very few commissions in Canada are meaningfully independent. Uh, it, they are meaningfully independent compared to many other places, but uh, in Canada, the way in which appointments are handled, uh, relatively limited terms for most of the uh, most of the nominees, um, the way in which uh, governments uh, require certain forms of accountability, the way in which the purse strings are held uh, by the government, all of those things limit the the meaningful independence of the human rights institution, which are controlled by lots of strings that are mostly operating behind the scenes. And so if, if you can't control your workload and you can't control uh, how it is you decide your own priorities, and if you are uh, administratively 
um, uh, curtailed, if you will, in terms of your, your work, then it becomes very difficult to actually choose priorities because the priorities are imposed on you. And so that means that um, you end up uh, having difficulties in terms of managing your caseload because you have almost no control over your caseload at all. Canadian commissions generally have to pretty much take anything that comes through the door except for you know, frivolous cases or aged cases and the like. Um, the way this plays out internationally, I mean, uh, every commission I've ever worked in, uh, and ombudsman, by the way, so I've also done ombuds work and transitional justice work, um, but on the complaints front, the problems in, I think, in, in international uh, institutions is that they don't have a formal connection to the legal system. So in most jurisdictions, uh, Sudan's actually one of them, uh, when you file a complaint, uh, it does not automatically go to the court system. The commission can make recommendations, the commission can, uh, can, can uh, uh, contact the other institution, try to make a, an amicable settlement and the like, but it does not formally take the case and go to a specialized human rights uh, adjudicative body. That's different than Canton, it's different than a lot of uh, Northern and Western Europe. Um, in Sweden, for example, they also have this idea of being able to litigate. If you don't have the teeth to go with the, the file, so to speak, if you don't have the ability to actually enforce uh, your decision, then uh, the institution is toothless and, and, and has a great deal of difficulty being taken seriously. And the government, generally speaking, has every interest in ensuring that institutions are not taken seriously. So contrast that to Canada. Now we've had this big case in at the federal level um, uh, called the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society case where an indigenous uh, uh, social worker brought a case to the Canadian Human Rights Commission then to the tribunal asking the uh, Canadian government to effectively eliminate systemic discrimination against indigenous kids on reserve. Uh, systemic discrimination on, against indigenous people on reserves, okay? Yeah, children. Children. In foster care specifically. So the, the data, briefly, the data showed that uh, Canada at the federal level, which of course has responsibility for, for um, Indian affairs, as, as, as it was called in the legislation, uh, we're spending 22 cents on the dollar less for uh, First Nations kids on reserve yeah. than other kids. Uh, and, and there were a lot of systemic consequences that flow from that, including people seeing foster care as being kind of the, the legacy of the residential school system. A lot of indigenous people see real continuity between, between those two. So um, that case went to the commission. Unlike many other countries where I've worked, the commission simply would have made a recommendation, sent a report to the government, and that would have been it. Uh, in the case of what happens in Canada, the decision of the commission actually goes to an adjudicative body that can then go to the courts, uh, and there was a decision that the government needed to fix that. And that decision has legal, needs to fix the discrepancy, and needs to fix all the systemic things that go with it, like, for example, First Nations kids being significantly overrepresented in the foster care system in Canada, among other things. Uh, and you know, we all know the connection between that and later on, you know, lower life indicators, health indicators, social indicators, uh, overrepresentation in prisons and the like. So, so these things are all connected and to have uh, national institutions that are actually able to um, say to the government, uh, you are required to do this. We have an administrative and a judicial system that, are, that is independent and is capable of actually uh, implementing uh, those decisions based on a system of governance where you have an independent judiciary. Um, so it's interesting that your description sort of provides uh, access to justice issues both nationally and internationally um, through a sort of a human rights system analysis that looks at uh, the courts and uh, commissions and sort of institution building as you talk about it and you just gave a, um, an important example of in Canada of how the court the liaison works well um, I want to ask uh, Aristide um, about um, institution building um, if it goes beyond commissions um, and maybe to flesh out a bit more of, of the technical assistance and and developing and, and accessing uh, justice and developing a human rights culture um, and on the tail of that, I want to ask, ask you both um, about uh, integrating um, education, human rights literacy, and your own scholarship in that area. Mm -hmm. Because you're, you've both been uh, faculty members and mm -hmm. teachers and scholars. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
I, mean, I guess what I'm getting at there is the relationship between your field work and your um, uh, academic work. Um, but that's the latter part of my question. My first question is, um, has to do with institution building and access to justice. Uh, are there other tools that you regularly recommend or see in play in your, your work in the field? Yep, uh, I would like to jump in this issue of access of justice. Um, just to tell you that one of the challenges we have been facing, maybe not only as my capacity or independent expert, but also as a human rights litigator before African human rights system, is the fact that to advocate for legal reform in the countries that you are covered, to advocate for constitutional reform. Um, we talk about access to justice, but in the case came to me when we were in a country where the system, the judicial system is very weak. This is the first issue concern. And not only that, we are also end up to the case where for sexual gender based violence, for example, people, women are victim of rape, sexual gender victim. And when our role is through human rights education, what are your rights, what are you, are you able to, to litigate your case? So our work is to some extent is to encourage them to bring the case before those systems, even if they are weak. One of the problems is the person concerned doesn't want to go to the court because of the fear of stigma affected to those women who have been affected. Also the fear of reprisal for the people, especially in the conflict zone, conflict affect zone, or in the country where you still have ongoing conflict. Because I remember a woman that I met in DRC Congo telling me that, you see, this is the guy with the gun who raped me last time. But I can't go to anywhere because she knows that if I went there the day after, he would come to my house. So what do you want me to do? You know, those are things that the challenge that we are facing on the ground in terms of just, for, uh, just take the case of sexual uh, gender-based violence, for example, women who have been affected by violence. So our role not only is to encourage the government also to, get, to bring all the perpetual of violence, of impunity, to, 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 uh, to end the impunity in those countries, but also through capacity building to the national civil society organization also to enhance them so as to get the minimum requirement to bring those cases before human rights mechanism, not only at the national level, sub-regional level, or national level, or international level. Uh, in Nigeria, we had a case, for example, was very sensitive. And I remember we went to the court to the, the same day with all the things, and the judge didn't show up. So the day after I called him, he said, no, 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 Mr. No, no, see. I didn't come because this case is very sensitive. Very sensitive. Very sensitive, and you don't know where you are bringing the country. So I will encourage you to bring the case at the regional level because no judge in this country will hear this case, I have to tell you. So those are the challenges we have been facing. At least we do have some recourses mechanisms at the regional level, international level as well. So talking about the Nigeria cases, we, we end up to bring this case at the sub-regional level because in Africa, for example, we do have five regional economies Commission, the ECOWAS, the SADC Tribunal, and for example, the ECOWAS Tribunal has a Court of Justice who also hear human rights cases. But let me tell you that initially, this Court of Justice was not set established to hear human rights cases. It was established to hear economic issues. But it ended up to hear human rights cases because one ECOWAS citizenship bring a case before the uh, court of justice, and the court of justice say, no, the, your case is not admissible, it's not receivable because we are not, as, and she said, look, I'm a cousin, a cousin citizen. If you don't hear my case, who can hear my cases? Do you want me to bring the case at the UN level? I don't, I don't have the means to go to UN. So the final have to amend, amend the, the rule of procedure to enable the court of justice now to hear uh, human rights cases, for example. So people now can litigate before human, uh, the Court of Justice for the Equals. And this is the same before the, all the Court of Justice of SADC Tribunal, the East African Tribunal, and the Central Africa also Tribunal. The, um, and do you address in your work as a challenge on the ground, or do you inculcate that into your, um, your actual recommendations or your dialogue, these informal systems of, of justice that uh, Pearl mentioned? For instance, you're, it's a graphic picture of the mm -hmm. woman coming to you mm -hmm. saying, uh, I would like to bring this person to justice, but I can't do that. He has the gun and the courts won't hear it. Are there, in those situations, do, are there informal systems of justice that, that influence your work? Or? The, this, one of the suggestions is to, to set up, for example, let's say we're talking about Sudan, 
to establish, for example, a special prosecutor for Darfur for special crime, for example. This has been established, a special prosecutor for, for Darfur crime. That's a goal to, to hear all the cases relating to violence, abuse, rape, and all those things. This is at the international level and national level. But to some extent, we also encourage them to establish kind of transitional justice, for example, to hear some cases that will be able to be heard by the national mechanism. But once again, can you, can you, just before you go on, can you explain what you mean by transitional justice? Now, these we are have, terms of art that you're familiar yes, with. Yes, we, we tend to have the, what we, we call, let's say, maybe informal justice, having, for example, to get involved the elders in the communities, for example, to hear the cases, and then if somebody, somebody will have to be punished to get in custody, they will bring this case to custody. If they find that this case is very grave to them, then they can bring it to the national justice through the national human rights institution that has been established, or through, for example, in the case of Sudan, for example, they also have this advisory commission, human rights commission that are based at the Minister of Justice also, that is able also to hear some cases. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you, you have a range, a panoply of, it seems, uh, access, uh, options and recommendations. Um, let me just ask both of you now, sort of looking forward. So you've raised a number of challenges um, and some of the creative uh, ways you think about them. Um, um, but looking forward, five years forward, um, what, uh, in, in terms of unfolding a vision, can you, in, can you identify one or two um, um, actions, options, recommendations that you see it as, as compelling for overcoming some of the challenge and access to justice, uh, in, institutional building, um, uh, individual cases, the delays. Uh, there, there's a whole panoply of, of issues you've identified, but do you see any, any options or recommendations uh, that are more compelling than others that you would, you would advocate for um, you know, prosecuting this vision of, of human rights change and culture and access to justice? I think the first one uh, is transnational justice. So uh, helping uh, human rights organizations and civil society organizations advocate for legislation uh, or common law developments to ensure that cases that happen in countries that have very weak judicial systems can actually be litigated in a country like Canada. So I'm, I'm closely involved with uh, an organization called the Canadian Center for International Justice. It's Ottawa-based. Um, and we've been involved in legal teams that have just won two huge, I think, hugely important cases in 2017, both of which have, uh, with regard to Guatemala and Eritrea respectively, decided that the actions of Canadian companies uh, that are engaged with or allegedly associated with human rights abuses, including uh, you know serious human rights abuses like like slavery and and forced labor, uh, that those kinds of cases can in fact be adjudicated in Canada if there's a sufficient connection to the jurisdiction, i.e., uh, a head office uh, in this country. Um, and historically, you know, Canadian courts have accepted form of non-convenience motions and have not uh, allowed those kinds of cases to move forward. These two cases in Canada this year, the Tahoe case in British Columbia uh, in two, January 2017 and the Nevson case uh, this month uh, at the British Columbia Court of Appeal, have both decided to accept jurisdiction now, you know, from, the, from uh, Guatemala and Eritrea respectively. Okay. So, so, interesting. so it is very interesting and, and I think, I think it means that we are, and, and in the Nevson case, the court decided that the hook, if you will, that gives the legal uh, uh, jurisdiction to the court uh, can be based on customary international law, which to the best of my knowledge in a, in a private law case is the first time it's happened in Canada. So I think, I think encouraging that kind of, of reciprocity and, and uh, uh, responsibility, I think is a better word, in jurisdictions like Canada to assume jurisdiction when there's a, a case like this helps other countries, I think, to, to look at what the elements are of countries that do respect the rule of law and start to implement them where it's possible. In Eritrea, clearly it was impossible and uh, Nebson Resources, the mining company in Eritrea, you know, was, was standing up before the courts and saying that the Eritrean court system was just fine. And, and to be clear, the, the mining company is Canadian or international? So the mining company, so something like 60 or 70 percent of international extractive industries in the world have head offices in Canada. Okay. So, so Nevson actually has a head office in Canada and it was an affiliated 
entity, i.e. affiliated to Nevson in Eritrea, that worked with the Eritrean government to bring conscripted labor, uh, sort of modern slavery, if you will, into the mine to build the gold mine in a, an area called Bisha. Um, so so I, I think the first real challenge is to start to have that kind of understanding of transnational justice as distinct from comparative law and distinct right. from international law and as distinct from domestic law and distinct from private international law to start to really see those connections and the kinds of things Aristide is talking about where you have the international institutions and regional institutions that are really reinforcing those norms uh, I think are, are a hugely important part of, of making that happen and I guess the second one that really interests me that I'm, I'm working on with the help of the folks at the human, uh, center here at McGill um, is this issue of, of how we ensure that civil society voices have a voice uh, and how you make sure that uh, national approaches to dealing with civil society enable them and empower them to do their best work. Um, in many countries, uh, governments will restrict registration requirements, they'll harass institutions, they'll go after boards of directors, they will kidnap, kill, uh, and disappear individuals who are closely connected with with uh, civil society organizations in Canada, it's less dramatic, but certainly under uh, the Harper regime, we had 10 years of, of a government that uh, used uh, tax legislation to actively harass um, uh, charitable organizations in Canada, restricted their advocacy. And although we have a report from uh, you know, a, a consultation group set up by the Liberals uh, saying we need to get rid of all of this, we need to ensure that civil society organizations do have a voice and can be advocates. Uh, even though we have this, the Liberal government, somewhat disappointingly, is not moving forward with, with substantial reforms. So, so many challenges ahead. Can I just be very clear about, uh, before I turn to, uh, to um, Aristide to conclude, can I just be very clear about the wrong that this Canadian mining company that didn't want to be confronted in Canada did in uh, in, in this other country? What is the alleged precise wrong? So the alleged precise wrong is that they contracted with uh, a subcontractor in Eritrea that was connected to the military so that the people who physically built the gold mine in Bisha were forced workers who had been conscripted from the army and were brought in and had no choice in doing so uh, to work in the mines, one, and two, that they were subjected to uh, not decent working conditions, that they were tortured uh, as a form of discipline. Um, many of them have uh, first and second degree burns from being put out in the, the sun uh, in a desert area when it was 47 degrees and were told to roll around when they hadn't done anything, uh, done what was expected of them to do and that was their punishment. So, you know, uh, cruel and unusual treatment uh, by any by any standard, uh, forced torture, labor. Uh, forced labor, conscription, uh, modern slavery. And that case is now before the Canadian courts. So the British Columbia Court of Appeal decided uh, a couple of weeks ago that indeed uh, the Canadian courts have jurisdiction to hear the case. So this has been already in the courts now on the forum non-convenience issue for, for months. Uh, that's been resolved and now we go back to the first level court uh, on the merits. And so Transnational justice of the type you just described is one um, potential promise and necessity you argue on uh, for the next five years in Aristide in your work. Can you identify um, necessities, uh, priorities uh, amongst the galaxy of challenges that you've outlined a bit? Yeah, oui, 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 oui. Um, je dois dire sur cet aspect, et ça me permet donc de jump in what elle a dit, que Une de nos préoccupations dans ce domaine aussi, c'est de voir les, la mise en œuvre des décisions de justice. Bien que ces décisions de justice ne sont pas suffisantes, les quelques décisions qui ont été prises, que l'État les mette en œuvre. Et c'est aussi une difficulté qu'on qu a, parce que souvent, comme vous le savez, les, les commissions font des recommandations, ce n'est pas « binding » comme on dit en anglais, Et même quand c'est binding, dans le cas par exemple des cours, vous avez des cas où le gouvernement dit c'est bien beau, mais moi je ne mets pas en œuvre. Qu'est-ce que vous faites Voilà. Et c'est ça, c'est ça l'un des grands défis. Tout, tout, c'est tout le débat de la soft et hard law qu on, qu on, dont on parle en droit international. L'État dit oui, mais moi je ne le mets pas en œuvre. Et ça me permet donc de peut-être de parler un peu de ce cas de, que nous avons aussi défendu quand elle m'a juste 
fait dans le, quand on parlait de mining industry, une compagnie canadienne aussi qui, dans le sud du Congo, a été complice avec les autorités, en ville mining pour ne pas la nommer, euh, de massacres. Il y a eu des gens qui ont été exécutés parce qu'il y a eu un soulèvement et puisque ça affectait un peu leurs activités, il a été établi que la compagnie minière a fourni des véhicules et de la logistique aux soldats qui ont massacré à peu près 70 personnes. 70. Et tous ceux qui allaient, donc il y a eu des blessés, il y a eu un véritable massacre. Et nous avons porté l'affaire devant la juridiction canadienne, mais ça n'a pas été euh, admissible, hein, recevable. Ça a été, a, 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 a été recevable en première instance, mais en seconde instance, ça, la décision de la première juridiction a été cassée. Et donc, en seconde instance, on a estimé que le cas n'était pas recevable parce que les faits étant passés en territoire, pas dans le territoire canadien, mais au Congo. Voilà, c'est exactement. Ce que nous avons fait, des années plus tard, nous avons porté l'affaire devant la Commission africaine des droits de l'homme en invoquant cette fois-ci la responsabilité de l'État congolais. Okay. Nous avons d'abord su la recevabilité parce qu'on on, on s'est demandé pourquoi c'est maintenant qu'on vient, parce qu'il faut épuiser toutes les voies de recours, ce que nous avions fait. Donc après la, le, le côté admissibilité, donc recevabilité d'affaires, la Commission a rendu sa décision cette année seulement. Ok où les personnes sont censées être euh, indemnisées à coût de millions de, euh, de dollars pour, par, par personne. Mais la difficulté qu'on a, est-ce que l'État va pouvoir va les mettre en œuvre Ça, c'est la difficulté. Ça, c'est le défi. Ça, c'est le défi. Ça, c'est un défi parce qu'on a vu par le passé que l'État, souvent, refuse de mettre en œuvre. Ses, ses... Parce qu'une fois que l'État met en œuvre, ses, hein, ça va susciter encore d'autres plaintes. Et souvent, ils ne veulent pas. Donc, ça, c'est le, le, le premier défi. Le second défi, c'est... Euh, dans le domaine de la coopération, c'est la notion de la fatigue des donneurs, « donneurs fatigue », comme on dit en anglais. Vous continuez de demander plus d'argent pour les, les, droits, les droits humains, les droits de la personne. À un moment donné, ils sont fatigués. Ils sont fatigués et il faut arriver à convaincre tous ces donneurs-là de la nécessité de continuer leurs efforts parce qu'à la fin du processus, nous parlons de la mise en œuvre des droits de l'homme, la promotion des droits de l'homme et de la personne et la protection des individus, surtout, surtout ceux qui n'ont pas la possibilité d'accéder au système de justice qui sont déjà établis. Ce sont les deux défis pour, pour, en, en ce qui me concerne dans le travail que je fais de tous les jours qui sont importants. La mise en œuvre des recommandations et la continuation d'avoir encore de la part des donneurs un grand intérêt pour la, la protection des droits de l'homme. Parce qu'il faut dire, dans certains cas, par exemple, et je, ça me permet de rebondir par exemple sur le cas de la du Soudan et de la Libye, par exemple, qui est encore... C'est que nous avons vu, par exemple, aujourd'hui, la notion des migrants, par exemple, qu'on est en train de bloquer, et qui, avec qui on coopère, on coopère le gouvernement libyen, euh, libyen ou le gouvernement soudanais, qui eux-mêmes sont coupables de violations des droits de l'homme. C'est ça la question. Par exemple, dans le cas de, de, de Soudan, on s'appuie sur les Djanjawi, elle doit savoir qui, qui sont les Djanjawi, qui est une ministre, parce qu'on on demande aux Djanjawi maintenant de stopper la vague migratoire. Voilà un peu des, des concerns, comme on dirait en anglais, qui, qui nous posent, parce que finalement, on se dit, où, 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 où allons-nous Donc, c'est des défis pour lesquels nous continuons de discuter avec les différents partenaires pour voir comment, sous quel angle approcher tous ces défis-là. Thank you. Um, you know, the last two cases you evoked uh, sort of responded to, at least um, uh, in terms of image and the compelling nature of the facts and the, the Canadian Uh, in one instance, a uh, company in the national, uh, perhaps, uh, um, co um, cooperation or facilitation mm -hmm. in, uh, on your issues of transnational justice, uh, lead, me, lead me to want to ask, although we don't have the time, is how you bring these examples into your, into your teaching, because those are compelling examples. And, but they do, they do answer one of the questions I ask is, why should we care? And I think that uh, it brings us back to where we began, which was, uh, Um, on these universal, uh, this notion of universal of human rights and their violations and, and defense uh, around the world. And you've, you've given a wonderful portrait of uh, certainly the challenges and maybe some hope for um, some uh, ways of remedying it uh, in the future. Um, so uh, with that, um, I would ask uh, that we conclude today's uh, uh, conversation and uh, thank you both for your contributions.